It is family day, and we've had this show up September. We had such an awesome time last week. If you were here last week, did you enjoy your time? Some of you did. Hey, last week, last week I was wearing my Chicago Bulls Michael Jordan jersey in church on a Sunday. We had show up with your colors, and uh, it was all about team. Pastor Austin shared an incredible message uh, about the team, and we even had some, a couple of our pastors up here doing a little dance routine. You might have, if you weren't here, you probably saw that on Facebook. That wasn't me. It was just somebody that looked like me that was in that video. That was a first for me, too. So... Anyway, glad that you're here today. Mary Hayes, our, one of the ladies that works in our office, she said to me Friday, she said, I feel sorry for whoever, who's preaching on Sunday? I feel sorry for whoever had to follow Pastor Austin and a great message and hot dogs and donuts and everybody dressing down in their favorite team colors. And they said, guess what? That's me. So, all right, awesome. Man, you guys are, are excited. I was kind of hoping for some applause like the choir got. Was that not awesome or what? We have some incredible, it's so great to see so many people in the choir too, and they're getting ready, gearing up for a Christmas uh, musical, and uh, we're excited to see what's, what's, what's going to happen there. Some of you uh, had wanted to order t-shirts, and last Sunday was the deadline for that, but guess what? We didn't, we didn't make that order this week, so you have one chance today to get your New Hope t-shirt. If you haven't got it ordered, stop by at the uh, event center, order that with your money. Today is the day we're making the order tomorrow, so wanted to make you aware of that. Pastor Weaver and Susan are on vacation, and uh, they will be back this week, so we want to give a shout out to them, because I'm sure they're watching somewhere uh, in the middle of nowhere. They've got a Wi-Fi connection somewhere out west. They're out west looking at national parks and having a great time relaxing there, but keep them in your prayers as they head home this week, and uh, pray that God has just given them a good time of rest. All right. I think I got all my preliminary stuff done. Hey, not only is today Family Day as part of our show up September, but it is Grandparents Day. And we would just want to say to all of our grandparents that are here, uh, Happy Grandparents Day. If you're a grandparent, would you just stand so we can honor you and recognize you? We have got a lot of grandparents in the room. Awesome. I'm standing as well. This is, this is uh, my wife, Jeannie, and I, our first uh, official Grandparents' Day of being grandparents. And I thought, since it's Grandparents' Day, and since I have the microphone, and since I'm speaking, I can uh, show off the one who made me a grandpa this year. So if you'll turn your eyes to the screen here, this is our little Barrett. <laughs> now, study this picture really well, because there's a picture that follows this, and you'll kind of get an idea of what's going on. What's the next picture? See, look at that. Did you catch that? I want you to go back and see the first picture. This is like proud grandpa moment. Look at that. Look at that face. What do you suppose he's doing? <laughs> now show the second one. Oh, it's just so much better. That was a before and after picture. <laughs> proud grandpa moment. Yes. Little Barrett. And here's a couple other pictures that I thought were, were noteworthy. This is just, this is just last week, him playing at home in his PJs. Cute little guy, look at him hiding under the, he, he's a handsome little guy, look at him. He will be, he will be one year old on October 2nd, so uh, we're just three weeks away from his first birthday. He is an awesome, awesome little guy, so proud of, of our kids and uh, the job that they're doing raising him and uh, so proud to be his grandpa. I'm not old enough to be a grandpa, but at least I don't feel like I'm old enough to be a grandpa. I heard Mavis has a birthday today. I just looked out and looked right at Mavis. I had like three people say Mavis has a birthday today. So I don't know what number. Mavis, shout out to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. <laughs> so it's Grandparents Day, and there are actually a couple of passages of Scripture that speak to grandparents. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. And uh, I would have to say that it's a pretty special thing. And uh, Proverbs 13:22 says, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. And uh, I don't believe that that passage is necessarily talking about money or wealth or things. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. Righteous people live wise lives. And they pass on wisdom. They pass on knowledge. They may pass on material possessions and blessings, but 
We as, as grandparents and as parents have a legacy to pass on. And I wanna, I wanna talk about just that this morning. As it's family day and being on grandparents day, I thought it very appropriate for us to, to, to speak on the topic of legacy. Legacy, what is a legacy? Legacy is what you leave with people you're closest to after you're gone. That's what you leave with people when you're gone from this earth. You know, there's surveys, several surveys that have been done with centenarians, people who are 100 years old and over. And I found out this week that in the, the latest census, uh, which was taken in 2010, there were 53,364 people living in the United States that are over 100 years old. 53,000 that are 100 years and older, compared to 30 years before, 32,000. So in just 30 years, that number increased 65%. We've got a lot of people with some seasoned age. Out of those 53,000 people that are 100 years or older, 82.8% of them are female. So ladies, you've got a much better chance of surviving in the long haul. But of these uh, surveys that were, that were done, um, one particular study asked these folks if they had any regrets in their lives, and one of the top answers that was given was, I wish I could leave something that lives beyond me. Really what they're saying is, I wanna leave a legacy. Something that I'll be remembered for that will be passed on to, to succeeding generations. It really just comes down to this. I want my life to count. I wanna know that my life will count, that it has meaning and significance. I had a conversation this week with someone, and, and this is something that I've thought through in my life, that um, you know, if, if for some reason I would find uh, that, I, that I have cancer, and I know we have people who are battling cancer, um, I know it would be a devastating thing, but if for some, some way God could speak to me and say, Jeff, here's the deal, you have cancer, and you're gonna die of cancer, but I can guarantee you that as a result of you going through cancer, all five of your children and your grandchildren will end up in heaven someday. I'm saying I would gladly do that. I would take it in a heartbeat. I wouldn't even think twice. How many of you are with me? I would go through whatever I need to go through and take whatever would come my way. If I could have a guarantee that my children and my grandchildren would end up in heaven someday, I will do, sign up for whatever because I wanna know that what I'm doing in life counts. And if that's what it takes to ensure that they get to heaven, I'm all in, not even a second thought. If we're gonna leave a legacy in this life, it's gonna take having focus. Focus on the right things. John Maxwell said this, he put it this way, achievement comes to someone when they're able to do great things for themselves. Achievement comes to someone when they are able to do great things for themselves. Success comes when they empower followers to do great things with them. But legacy is created only when a person puts his organization or his family into a position to do great things without him. That's legacy. Legacy is what you leave with people that you're closest to after you're gone. It's what lives on after you die, how you'll be remembered. It's the impact that you made in this life while you were here. And so the question isn't if you will leave a legacy, but what kind of legacy will you leave? And we're talking about a spiritual legacy. John Maxwell goes on to say, what we leave as a legacy reveals our priorities. It unveils whether what we did in life pointed to Jesus or it pointed to us. It's the testimony of God's work in our lives, the spiritual inheritance or baton that we leave to others. God's plans for the church has always been that one generation would pass the baton of the testimony of Jesus to the next generation all the way until his return. So you and I are just another series of runners in that race. So in track and field, relay races, are won and lost at the handing off of the baton. If you're in a, a relay sprint, to drop the baton is literally to lose the race. All the hard work, all the training, everything could be lost in one single fumble of the baton. So the, the rule number one in relay events is never drop the baton. That's the most important thing in a relay race, how you hand off that baton. Same is true of life. 
We've never really successfully finished the race of life until we've passed our baton on to the next generation. And so this morning, being Grandparents' Day, being Family Day here in our Show Up September uh, month, I want to talk about building and leaving a spiritual legacy for your family. And there's so many different stories, so many different people in the Bible that we could, that we could look at today, but I want to look at the life of Abraham. Abraham ran the race of faith, but Abraham made sure to pass on the baton to succeeding generations. I want to read for you from Hebrews chapter 11. It's the, the, the chapter of faith. My Bible should have been there. Hebrews chapter 11 says this about Abraham, starting in verse, verse number 8. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All right. I realize I'm holding this microphone and I'm gonna switch to the other microphone. Austin's probably going, when are you gonna put down the microphone? <laughs> Carrie gave me that microphone and I gotta hand off the baton, sorry. I realize, why am I holding this microphone? <laughs> hand it off to the next person, who wants to take it? No, no takers, got it, all right. So Abraham accomplished more than making a great name for himself. He succeeded in more than blessing the people of his lifetime. Abraham left a legacy by enabling succeeding generations to do great things for God even without him. And so this morning, we're learning how to pass the baton. And I'm not saying we're at the end of our race and we're passing, but here's the thing. You learn how to pass the baton way before you ever get to the point of needing to pass the baton. So if you're part of a relay team, you've been in track and field and you're part of a relay team, how often do you practice handing off the baton? Drill after drill after drill, hand off the baton. Get in, your, get in your blocks, take off, pass, pass the baton. It's just, it, it has to happen. And so this morning, um, we, we realized we haven't really completed our race spiritually until we've passed off the baton, but we need to think about how do we do that? And so I've got four words that I want to share with you this morning, and uh, we're going to unpack those just a little bit. The first word is relationship. We need to develop relationship if we're going to uh, leave a legacy for our family. Really, this has to do about, with training and teaching and coaching. One of the main reasons God chose Abraham for this task of founding a nation is that he knew that Abraham would instruct his, his descendants in the way of the Lord. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God said this, I have singled him out, meaning Abraham, so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do all for Abraham, all that I have promised him. So Abraham set this pattern into motion that we see all throughout the scriptures. Parents are given the privilege and the responsibility of teaching their children about the Lord. That's our job as parents. Several hundred years after Abraham, Moses wrote this commandment to the Israelites, Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Some versions say, teach them diligently to your children. Teach them carefully to your children. Recite them. Repeat them again and again. Set an example for them. The message version says it like this. Get them inside of you, meaning the, the commandments. Get them inside of you, and then get them inside of your children. So we're to model that. We're to first start with us, 
Because it's going to be impossible for us to pass off something that we don't possess in the first place. Get them inside of you, and then you can get them inside of your children. So going back, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So God's people were instructed to teach and to model following the way of the Lord. This was part of home life. We're always talking about, always teaching, always directing things back to how does the Lord come into this? God was integrated into every area of their life. The word of God was a central part of their life. They talked about it. They, 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 they trained their children that way. They modeled. They, they worked together. It was everything that they did in life had to do around doing this together and bringing God into it. The traditions, all the stories about God and his people, the commandments, those were to permeate their lives. Parents were called to coach their children and their grandchildren in the way of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament says this, Bring up your children. Bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's not the school's responsibility or the church's responsibility. Parents are to make sure that their children understand faith. We're to be the example. We're to live it out in front of them. For some reason in our culture, many parents have come to believe that it's the professionals, it's the pastors, it's the teachers that are supposed to teach, coach, and train their children. And somehow we as parents have become more like the cruise director just getting our kids to all their extracurricular activities. The school does their thing, the church teaches about faith, and all I do is get my kids to all their extracurricular activities. No, the reality is we're the teachers as parents and as grandparents. What what kind of faith are our kids learning in school, in public school, in the government schools? They're not learning this faith. And I'm not knocking the schools because it's not their job to teach this. They're going to teach it horribly if they do. Us as parents, as grandparents, this is our responsibility, first of all, to know it and then be able to transfer that and pass that on to generations that follow. That is our job. We have to teach about faith. At New Hope, we're, we're very, very fortunate to have, I believe, in my opinion, the absolute best children's pastors and youth pastors that you can find anywhere. And I mean that. But the reality is, it's not their job to teach your kids about faith. They are teaching, but they're a supplement to that. They're good. But they can't, teach, they can't teach your kids everything. You think about two to three hours a week, if you take Sunday morning, Sunday school, Wednesday night, you put all that together. If you have them here for all of those, maybe three hours a week. That's not, that's not training enough. How many, days, how many hours are they in school a day? How many hours are they in your home a day and, and throughout the week? As parents, we're the teachers. We're the coaches. God has given our children to us. It's our job to teach, to train, to instruct, to equip, to discipline them in the ways of the Lord. And it's our job to model that in the way that we live. That's our responsibility that God has given to us. And listen, there's no guarantee that you doing all of that is going to raise a child that is going to follow in the faith. But what's going to happen if you don't teach them? We begin passing on the baton early as we coach them in the ways of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6 says to train up a child in the way they should go. New Living Translation, direct your children onto the right path. Again, the message says point your kids in the right direction. When they are old, they won't be lost. So here's the deal. We're planting seeds. We're putting uh, truth into them. We're putting life into them. We're teaching them faith. We're modeling faith. It's going to be up to them at some point. Are they going to take that faith and continue to walk that way? At some point, it's their choice. But the promise that we have from God's word is that if we train them, instruct them, and teach them in the way that they should go, when they're old, they won't be lost. They might get lost along the way, but they'll know how to get back to the path. 
Don't ever give up on your response. Don't ever give up on hope that that, that wayward child is just never going to come back. Don't ever give up hope. And while you have a chance, grandparent, while you have a chance, parent, you pour into their lives. We never stop being a parent. We never stop being a grandparent. And the responsibility and the privilege that we have is raising them, teaching them, training them, equipping them, modeling for them the way of the Lord. It's a privilege. It comes out of relationship. The second word that I want to give you this morning is example. Be the example. And and in that I'm saying make godly choices. You see, the choices that we make determine whether we leave a good legacy. If we go back to the series that I, that I, that I shared a few weeks ago, I, I talked about how it was a decision that I made when I was in high school, sitting in a youth group with six kids, about my future life and, and purity and those types of things that helped me at different times in my life where that was tested. And because I made a decision back there, it helped me through these times. So here I am today to be able to say to all the students that I had for 18 years of youth ministry, you can do this. You can stay pure. I can teach my children. Purity matters. And you can do this. I'm an example. But even if I, even if I had fallen in that, I still have the responsibility to teach my kids, look, I messed up, but I'm going to do everything I can to show you and teach you and help you through this so that you don't fall the way that I fell. I'm a coach. No coach is going to send their, their player into a, into, a, into a play where they're going to get crushed. You're going to give them the best chance possible. We want the best possible for our children. So as I, as I talk about this this morning, I'm, I'm talking to parents, I'm talking to grandparents, but teenagers, I'm, I'm talking to you as well. You don't wait till you're a parent to decide, what am I going to leave as a legacy? It starts right now. And I'm telling you, so the decisions that you make today Maybe the decisions that you've made previous to this part of your life, decisions that you make as teenagers, it's going to affect where you go in life. It's not about an event. It's about a course. It's about a direction. And so the choices that you make today in your life are going to determine the legacy that someday you're going to leave children or grandchildren or whoever it is that you have an opportunity to influence. It begins right now. We need to make godly choices. We need to be godly examples. And for the most part, Abraham made godly choices the reality is there's some scriptures that, that show us where Abraham, Abraham sinned. Abraham made some mistakes. The Bible records some of those things. But Abraham's life was characterized by godly decisions. And Abraham's life was characterized by blessings that followed those decisions. I want you to remember this. It's not what you do some of the time that matters. It's the choices that you make most of the time. Does that make sense? Sometimes we make some bonehead decisions, and if we could go back and change things, how many of you would change some decisions and choices that you made in life, okay? It's not the decisions and and the choices that you make some of the time that matters, it's the things that you decide most of the time. So Abraham's choices were godly, and and even his his neighbors that were around him, we're going to look at a passage of scripture if you turn to Genesis chapter 3, even the neighbors that that lived around him saw in, in Abraham something different. So we talked about in in the passage of Scripture in Hebrews uh, that Abraham was a foreigner in the land. He lived in tents. He lived in a land that wasn't his own. You remember God called him, uh, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham to go and to leave his country, and he said, I'm going to send you to a place that I'm going to bless you with that land, and that's going to be your land someday, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And so Abraham, when God said that, he just packed up and and moved. And his whole adult life from that point on, he lived in tents in a foreign land. He had no idea where God was taking him. He just, by faith, went. And when he got there, he just lived where God told him to live. And he made godly, wise choices. So in chapter 23 of Genesis, nearing the end of his life, and actually his wife Sarah has died, Verse 1, Genesis chapter 23. When Sarah was 127 years old, she died at Hebron in the land of Canaan. There Abraham mourned and wept for her. 
Then leaving her body, he said to the Hittite leaders, these foreign people's land that he was living in, here I am, a stranger in a foreign land and a foreigner among you. Please sell me a piece of land so that I can give my wife a proper burial. Being a foreigner in a foreign land, he couldn't buy property, he couldn't own property. But here he is, his, he's in this land, his wife Sarah has died, he's sorrowful, he's mourning her death, 127 years old, and now she's gone, and he needs a place to bury her. And so he's asking them, please sell me a piece of land so I can give my wife a proper burial. The Hittites replied to Abraham, listen, my Lord, you are an honored prince among us. Choose the finest of our tombs and bury her there. No one here will refuse you help in any way. So how did they see Abraham? They saw him as a chosen prince. They recognized something in Abraham. There was something about, they recognized the godly character and the godly nature in Abraham. And so he brings them this request and they say, you can bury her anywhere you want to. You just name the place. Verse seven, Abraham bowed low before the Hittites and said, since you are willing to help me in this way, be so kind as to ask Ephron, son of Zohar, to let me buy his cave in Mechpelah, down at the end of his field. I will pay the full price in the presence of witnesses, so I will have a permanent burial place for my family. Ephron was there sitting uh, among the others, and he answered Abraham as others listened, speaking publicly before all the Hittite elders in the town. No, my lord, he said to Abraham, please listen to me. I will give you the field and the cave. Here in the presence of my people, I give it to you. Go and bury your dead. Abraham again bowed low before the citizens of the land, and he replied to Ephron as everyone was listening, no, listen to me. There's a lot of this listening to me going on. I will buy it from you. Let me pay the full price for the field so I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, please listen to me. This is the whole, I'm honoring and preferring each other. It's like, no, I'll give it to you. No, I'm only going to pay for it. No, listen to me. I'm going to give it all to you. No, you listen to me. I'm going to pay the full price. And Ephron says, no, Abraham, listen to me. I'm going to give it all to you. Okay? My Lord, please listen to me. The land is worth 400 pieces of silver or 10 pounds of silver. But what is that between friends? Go ahead and bury your dead. So Abraham agreed to Ephron's price and paid the amount he suggested. So he's saying, look, it's 400 pieces of silver. You don't want to pay that much for that. That's double the price of what it's worth. Just go bury him. He said, good, I'll take up, I'll take 400 pieces. I'll give you 400 pieces for it. That's what he did. The amount of 400 pieces weighed according to the market standard. The Hittite elders witnessed the transaction. So Abraham bought the plot of land belonging to Ephron in Mechpelah near Mamre. This included the field itself, the cave it was in, and uh, the surrounding trees. It was transferred to Abraham as his permanent possession in the presence of the Hittite elders at the city gate. Then Abraham buried his wife Sarah there in Canaan in the cave at Machpelah near Mamre called Hebron. So the field and the cave were transferred from the Hittites to Abraham for use as a permanent burial place. All right, so he ends up with this, this place to bury Sarah and it cost him 400 pieces of silver, more than twice the amount that it was worth. But Abraham was a man of character. So we've got, we've got him living in this land and his, his choices, it came down to his choices. And I believe that Abraham was blessed uh, both the people that were around him. Others took note of the godly character that was in him and the choices that he made. His past followed him to the present and it endured through to the future so that his descendants could build a godly heritage and that they would follow by making godly choices. They could live out the same faith. They could live out the same obedience. They could experience the same blessings. You and I can never do that perfectly, but here's the deal. With God's help, we can make, we can make godly choices too. We can, we may make mistakes sometimes, but we need to trust in God that we can make godly choices ourselves. So what about you? Are you leaving a legacy of godly actions to generations that will follow you and your family, that, that generations will talk about you in that way? Will there be blessings and positive outcomes flowing from your life that will cause others to desire to follow in your footsteps? Here's what, here's what I want you to hear. Be the example. It comes out of relationship, and it comes by being the example. The third word that I want to give you this morning is, is truth. Live for truth. 
Stand for truth. Develop a character that is free from compromise. And this goes back to the story of, of Abraham with the Hittites. Even in, the, in his old age, Abraham was uncompromising when it came to his faith. So we've got this guy, Ephron the Hittite, right? Offered in the free use of his cave at, at, at Mechpelah. And it sounded, like, it sounded like a good offer. Listen, I'm just going to give this to you. Abraham, I want you just to take it. But Abraham, in his wisdom, knew if I take this free thing from him, there's probably going to be some string attached. Meaning he's may, they may want to work out some family marriage or something like that. And he's going, look, I live in a land of pagan people. They're not godly people. And if I take this from him, he's going to expect something in return from me. And I don't want to, I don't want to owe him anything. I don't want to let a foothold, a stronghold in my life where some, something can happen to destroy what I've worked so hard to build. This is why he chose to buy the cave at an inflated price rather than simply accepting it as a gift. 400 pieces of silver was a steep price. But he did that and chose that rather than compromise in a corrupt and pagan culture. Think what would have happened. What would have happened if Abraham Abraham had compromised at this point? All the things that he had built, his acts of faith, his obedience would be called into question. He would have no legacy left because his descendants would have always suspected his motives. Why did he do that? Maybe Abraham was more concerned about himself than we really, really thought. Instead, he developed character free of compromise, and it was evidenced here in this story, and his descendants remembered it forever, and it was written down in the book so that they would remember it. You see, people admire an uncompromising person. When you stand for your values, when you stand for your faith, even if they don't agree with you, there's something admirable admirable about someone who will stand up for truth, who will live the truth and stand up for what's right. There's something admirable about that and enables us to leave a legacy, to pass the baton with a character that's free of compromise, that verifies our motives, our attitudes, and our actions. The fourth thing that I want to share with you uh, this morning is, is, is testimony. Testimony. Abraham purchased this tomb in Canaan. It was a sign of more things to come. See, we all, have a, we all have a testimony. We all have a story. And we need to share our story. My, my, my parents are here with, with us today. And, uh, you know... We all grow up in our, in our homes and our families with stories, stories about our, our families. Um, I remember hearing stories about my, my, my grandfather, my grandparents. I was just talking to my mom, just verifying that my grandparents came to know the Lord in 1936. And my grandmother had, um, had grown up in church. She knew faith and had kind of gotten away from that. Well, they had a child that was born and, and, and died eight days later. My mom's oldest brother lived to eight days and then passed away. Shortly after that, my my grandmother went back to church. Nothing like uh, some kind of a tragedy, something that shakes you to turn you back to the place where where your roots are from. And out of that that choice, out of that decision to go to church, she gave her heart and life back to, to the Lord. Something changed in her, and my grandfather saw that. And I don't think he had grown up knowing anything about the Lord. My grandfather, um, at age seven, I believe, and I'm trying to remember the stories, it's not the details, but his dad had passed away and there were four other siblings. And so at age seven, he went to work to help provide for the family. And it was about that time, and I remember hearing these stories from my grandfather who's passed away now 26 years ago. But I remember these stories, and he had told me about how he had started smoking when he was seven years old working in the coal mines in Arkansas. And... um, but he was working to provide for his family. And uh, amazing through all of that, he had an eighth grade education. But after my grandmother had gone to church and came home, he saw something in her. He said, whatever she has, I want. And so he went to, he went to church, gave his life to the Lord. And it set in, in, in motion a legacy that you look back over however many years it's been now, 80 years-ish, 
to see what has happened and a family and the difference that it's made in the person's life. He told, he told me this story many, many times about how he walked out of church that night after giving his heart and life to the Lord. Nobody said anything, to, nobody told him anything, but at this point he had been smoking, I think about two to three packs of cigarettes a day. He had been smoking since he was seven. And he walked out of the door that night, had two packs of cigarettes in his pocket, and he just said, Some, something in, in, in my spirit just told me I don't need these anymore. Wasn't a person. Nobody, nobody said, you've got to stop smoking. He just said he walked out the door that night, took those two packs of cigarettes, and threw them out into a dark field and never smoked again. Amazing. So these are the stories of faith that I grew up hearing, hearing, hearing those types of stories. My grandpa was an incredible storyteller, and he, he had what he called his corny jokes. Anybody have grandparents that tell corny jokes? Any of you corny joke tellers? Okay. <laughs> so... I would tell you, if, if it happened once, it happened 200 times, to be sitting at the table with my grandpa, and uh, before we'd ever start a meal, he would, he would tell one of, his, one of his corny jokes, and this is the one I remember the most. He, he, this was the joke. What, was, what did the farmer say uh, when there was only one beat left on the table? That beats all. And I heard that probably two or three hundred times, and every time he would say it, I would laugh. Because it was my grandpa telling the story, that beats all. Some of you are catching up. <laughs> it's a corny joke. I love my grandpa. And the things that, that he told me, the time that I spent with him, the things that he instilled in my life as a grandfather, I hope and pray that I'm that kind of a grandfather that will pass on those types of things to my grandson. It's a legacy. It was choices. It was decisions. And, and not, a, not a shame to tell the story. Where did we come from? What happened in our life? You should be able to tell those stories to your children, tell those stories to your grandchildren. Repeat, repeat them over, like obnoxiously repeat them over and over. It goes back to the first point about being in relationship, you know? Teaching, training, equipping. You gotta attach life to it so that they can take hold of it and say, yeah, I get that, I see how that works. And maybe they don't, but some point in life it's gonna, it's gonna click, it's gonna connect. So Abraham had a testimony, his descendants would own that piece of land. Just see, you go back and God promised Abraham this land, and that's the promised land, right? That's where this cave is, that's where this burial, thing, it's in the promised land. Years before they actually come into the promised land and take hold of it, guess what, there is a little burial tomb and some trees around it that, that Abraham bought for 400 pieces of silver. That was their claim in the promised land. And if they went through 400 years of slavery in Egypt, I'm sure their mind, as the stories were told, there's this plot of ground where Abraham was buried, where Sarah was buried, where Isaac, Rebecca, Joseph, or Jacob, and, Ra and Leah were buried in that tomb. They're all buried there. So in a single purchase, Abraham tied his descendants to this, this land of promise. He left a legacy by giving them something to remember God's goodness. So the corny, the corny joke about the beat, you know, that's just fun. But there's things that my grandfather taught me. There's things that my parents have taught me that, that ring in my head when I'm, when I'm faced with a decision, when I'm faced with a choice, when, when life is happening and I'm going back to these times where I've been taught and trained and instructed. See, my parents just didn't take me to church and drop me off. They lived it for me. We went to church together as a family. That's what we did. There was no question about, should I go to church? It wasn't even a question, can I, can I not go to church? Didn't even ask that. I honestly didn't even ask that question. I knew it was an important thing, and it was something that we did because we were people of faith. So we need to remember God's goodness. That theme is common in the Bible, testimony, telling of God's goodness, telling what God has done. Go to Joshua chapter 4, and it says that in Gilgal, Joshua set up the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan River. So as they were crossing into the land, they didn't know how they're going to get across because the Jordan River was flooded. But what did God do? He parted the waters. And the scripture says that they walked across on dry ground. So Joshua chapter 4, verse 21, Joshua said to the Israelites, as, as he's commanding them to do this, in the future, your children are going to ask, what do these stones mean? Because he gave them the, the, the responsibility of picking up a stone out of the Jordan River, and on the other side, they piled up these stones. They piled up their memorial stones. 
Because in the future, your children are going to ask, what do these stones mean? And you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry, dry ground. Dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before their eyes, and he kept it dry until they were all across, just as he did the Red Sea. He had done this before. And when he dried it up until we had all crossed over, he did this so all nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and so that you might fear the Lord your God forever. We need memorial stones. We need monuments in our life. You realize that our lives are monuments of what God has done. God has done amazing things in every single one of your lives. I don't care how long you've known the Lord. I don't care if you've walked with the Lord your whole life, if you've just come to faith. If you haven't come to faith, God's still at work in your life. You're you're a monument of God's power and his presence that is amazing, that does amazing things. We've got to tell those stories. You say, well, my story doesn't sound like much. You tell the story and tell the story over and tell the story, and you start realizing, I've got a lot of stories to tell. I have a story about a lawnmower in my past. Some of you have heard the story of my lawnmower. Some of you haven't. Guess what? I've mowed my yard three times with my little red lawnmower that's 18 years old. I've mowed my yard three times without gas. Ask me how it happened. I have no idea. It's as shocking to me as it is to anybody. And this is a story of faith for me. You're going, well, that sounds like you got, probably got better things to tell than that. No, I'm serious. I mowed my yard when I didn't have any gas. I started up my mower. I had this much gas in the tank. I started it up because I didn't want to go to the, I didn't want to go to the gas station to get gas because it was six o'clock, October the sixth. It was my son Zach's sixteenth birthday. It was a, it was a Tuesday night. I had taken him to driver's ed and I came back and I had to get the front yard mowed because we'd been on vacation. We'd gone to Alaska with John and Darla Fitzpatrick for our 20th anniversary and we got home and I hadn't had my yard mowed for like two and a half weeks and I'm thinking I've got to get this yard mowed because my neighbors are going to be angry with me. My next door neighbors are sitting here this morning too. So I had to get my (laughs) yard mowed for them. And so I got home and it's six o'clock and it's getting dark because it's October 6th and I thought I don't have time to go to the gas station to get gas for my lawnmower and I opened the thing and there's like this much in my gas tank so I thought you know what I'll see you as far I'll see how far I can get have you ever done that I don't want to go get gas I'm just going to see how far I can get so I pulled the string and I thought if I can just get the front yard mowed at least it'll like make my neighbors happy so I mowed the front yard and then I went into the backyard and I started mowing in the backyard and I mowed all around this little fence that we had in the backyard and I've got some land that's across the ditch in the backyard and I went across and I mowed all of that. The whole time, I'm, and I'm going up and down a hill, so gas in an in a, in a engine, it doesn't really work that way very well. But halfway through this and I'm realizing I should be out of gas. It should be dead, but it's not. And so halfway through this, I'm going, how is this happening? And, I, and it's like all of a sudden I just started trembling. And I'm thinking, God, you're trying, you're trying to tell me something here. And I said, I spoke out loud these words over my mower. God, I'm listening to you. I'm all ears. I don't know why I responded that way. But I realized this doesn't happen. This, this like physically you can't make a mower engine run without gas. But mine is running without gas. And at this point I'm trembling as I'm mowing. And I'm going, God, you're telling me something. I don't know what you're telling me. But I decided at that point, I'm going to tell everybody I see about my lawnmower that runs without gas. <laughs> and I told people, I told people that I'd mowed without gas, and people were going, oh, that's nice. And I'm going, <laughs> stop for a minute. I mowed my lawn without gas in the lawnmower. How do you do that? I can't make it happen. But I've done it two other times, and the only time it's happened in succession to that is the same time, okay? I don't have any in my engine in the gas tank, and I don't have any in the gas can. If there's some in the gas can, I'm going to put that into the tank. But every time it comes to where I have no resources, that's the point when it happens. And don't, I can't explain how, I can't explain why, I just know that that happens. And I've heard so many people, me telling that story, say, Pastor Jeff, you don't, you don't realize, I, I went to my lawnmower, I didn't have any gas, and I thought, Pastor Jeff did this. See if, see if it works for me. 
And if, if that's all that happens, for people to have moments where they say, you know what, I could trust God to make my mower work without gas. I've heard so many stories. I heard a story today of Jack and Norma. They told me a story about being out somewhere um, in Colorado, I think, and they've been driving all day and realized they were up in the mountains and they hadn't got gas all day. And he's going, oh my goodness, we haven't got gas. We've got to pray that we're not, uh, we're, we won't run out of gas. And so they went farther than they thought they should and they got to this gas station and Jack got out to put gas in his tank. They've been driving all day, hadn't got gas in their gas tank in their car. He was only able to put 50 cents of gas in the tank. How does that happen? He said, it happened. I'm telling you, like, I'm telling you now, he said, it happened. How many of you have a story like that? Okay, they may seem so simple and insignificant, but those are moments where you can say, God did this for me. Some of you have some moments where God did some absolutely amazing, miraculous things of healing, of deliverance, of providing where you shouldn't have been provisioned. Those are stories that we need to tell. We all have a story. We all have a testimony. The psalmist says in Psalm 71, Oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your might and miracles to all who come after me. And that's what we need. We need our voice. We need a testimony. We need to share our story. We need to keep telling our stories. What I'd love for you to do is spend the afternoon here listening to other people's stories. Jack and Norma just told me that story because I had a story. They told me their story. We have all kinds of stories to tell. People come to faith because of story. People come to faith because of testimony. What has God done? He's done things I can't even explain. This is the God that I, that I, I sacrifice for, I give up for, I do these things for, I live for. I, I, we bring our kids to church because God's done amazing things and I want them to know that God will do amazing things in their life. When God intervenes in our lives, we need to leave reminders to coming generations of God's goodness to us and that's called testimony. Set up some memorial stones in your life and tell people what God has done. You go back to pilgrims that came to this country. They nearly starved, but God provided for them. And so they had a big meal. And guess what we celebrate every Thanksgiving now? We call it Thanksgiving. Why do we do that? I don't know. Most of us don't even think about that. But it's a memorial to some people who nearly lost their life at one time, but God provided for them, and so they gave thanks with a feast. And we're still giving thanks with feasts. It's called a memorial. There's a story about a, I'm, I'm, I'm going, going over and I'm going to wrap up right here. There's a story, I have it in my notes here, but I, I just want to tell this story to you because it, it's another one of those kind of, it's not my story, it's nobody that I know. I just came across this story. It's a story about a man who was a man of prayer, a godly man, who was in a field one day working alone. Somehow he started a fire that quickly burned out of control. He knew that he couldn't stop it and that the fire threatened to scorch his neighbor's property. He, could, he was helpless, he couldn't do anything. He knelt to the ground and he called out to the Lord for help. What happened next was nothing other than a miracle. A small cloud rode in over the field and rain fell in that spot and extinguished the fire. The surrounding country was completely dry and as his daughter tells the story, here's a daughter telling the story of what happened in her father's life, her father came home soaked to the bone and he walked in the house and walked into his room where he stayed for hours praying. That's a story that's been retold and retold, I'm sure, countless times about God's goodness and if we will tell those stories and we'll remember those stories of what God has done, it helps us to leave a legacy of what God can do, what God will do, not only in our children and our grandchildren and everybody that we have influence with. So the question is, are you leaving a legacy? Or will your children and your grandchildren, their children after that, have to create one from their own from scratch? Are you leaving a legacy? Are you giving them a foundation to build their own legacy on? Are you leading them, uh, leaving them with a faded memory of an unremarkable life? I'm convinced that God is doing remarkable things if we will all just open our eyes and pay attention and tell those stories. See, we're too entertained in our world. We don't listen to people's stories anymore. We listen to crazy things on TV, most bizarre things on YouTube videos. 
There's nothing godly about it at all. It's just like, is it even real? Is it even true? Is it, what is that? We'll watch made-up programs on TV. Well, we have the opportunity to tell real stories of what's happened. We need to listen and pay attention. I want you to bow your heads with me. We're going to pray. To leave a legacy, it takes focus. We've got to look at the big picture. We've got to look at the long term rather than concentrating exclusively on the personal short-term success, which is where many and most people are today. Personal short-term success. But for the good of coming generations, we need to pass a baton. It's called legacy. The greatest legacy stories of all time is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. That's what God did for us. He sent his son, Jesus, who gave his life, shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins and have the hope of an eternal life in heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask this question. This morning you came here. One, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. Or two, you did a long time ago, but you're not walking in that faith today. And it resonates with you today. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just asking for those of you here who would say, I need to give my life to Jesus. My life doesn't have a lot of meaning, but I... The Holy Spirit is speaking to me today that that's what I need. And if that's you, would you just raise your hand and keep your hand raised? Nobody's looking. Everybody's heads bowed. Nobody's looking around. Just keep your hand raised. Anyone else? As I look around, I see at least three or four hands. Five, six. Would you join me, everybody in the room, with, in a prayer like this? Jesus, thank you for giving your life. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. I give my life to you. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. Give me a hope and a future. In Jesus' name. Several people, I believe, this morning prayed that prayer, and in your heart, you're saying, yes, I'm saying a forever yes to Jesus. I invite him in, and I want him to change my life. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It's pretty simple. But now you're on a course, and there's people all around you that will come alongside of you and encourage you and help you in that. See, I, I know that there's some people this morning that God is speaking to your heart too because the reality is, is you've been focused on the short term and success in life and you haven't really been thinking too much about legacy. And the reality is there's people that are depending on you. There's people that are you influence. There's people that are, are looking to you. And maybe, maybe there's some legacy Maybe there's some pieces and parts, but you realize, I, I need a big picture focus. I need, I need the big picture, and I want my life to count. I want my life to matter. I want God to be number one, and I want him to do in my life what he did in Abraham's life and change generations. God's promised us things, and if we'll grab hold of those promises, it's not only going to affect us, it's going to affect generations of people down our line. No matter if you're a teenager or you're a, a, the eldest, oldest grandparent in the room, God will affect your life and the people that are connected to you for generations to come based on choices that you make today. And today you realize, I'm not been living that kind of a legacy. I want to leave a legacy when I'm done in this life that it can be said of me not to make me anything great, but it's, it's evidence in your children. It's evidence in your children's children. It's evidenced by the people that you're around in your workplaces, and they're saying there's something different about you. You're in your workplace, and you're surrounded by people like these Hittites. 
How do they see you? You have an opportunity to not only influence your family, but everybody around you. And how many of you this morning would say, I need a new focus. I want to leave something that's going to last way beyond my life here on this earth. I want, I want it to affect everybody around me. And today you say, I need a new focus, and I'm going to walk out of here with a different perspective. I'm going to walk out of here with a purpose for my family, for my friends, for people who don't even know me. I want, it to fo- I want that legacy to follow me way past my years. If that's you, would you just stand this morning saying, I, I, today I'm committing to a new focus, to leaving a lasting legacy.